welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. In this episode, I interview Alex Tarnava, founder and CEO of Drink HRW, a company that manufactures and markets molecular hydrogen tablets and an increasing number of other molecular hydrogen products that deliver this incredible molecule in different ways to the human body. Alex is the primary inventor of a clinically validated patented open cup hydrogen tablet. He's the man. His story about why and how he came to develop this product is the beginning of the podcast, and it is really actually quite fascinating. Interesting about Alex, you're going to learn a ton about molecular hydrogen in this podcast, which is really great because it is a fascinating molecule. If you've ever, if you spend any time in my Facebook group, you know that I am pretty fascinated with hydrogen. I've been using it myself and in my practice for the last few years now, ever since I first learned about it. And it never ceases to amaze me, the incredible results that people can get whether it's pain reduction, inflammation reduction, cognitive results, it's there's almost no end of conditions in the human body that molecular hydrogen can help with. So the other really cool thing about Alex is that he's not a one-dimensional guy. This is a guy who is really committed to not only producing the most effective and best-in-class products but he's also got a huge mission around helping to improve transparency of supplement companies around the products that they produce, the quality that they produce, and how effective their products really are, or should they even be marketed as what they are. So he's got a couple of um, really interesting projects on the side that he's working on. Join me in this interview. I hope that you really like it. I found it really fascinating. If you decide that you want to jump in and buy, get your hands on some of Alex's tablets, you can go to drinkhrw.com and type in the promo code longevity10 and you will get 10% off your purchase. It's um, it's all really great stuff. And I think it's one of the few places where you can get molecular hydrogen tablets that are actually flavored. Anyway, without further ado, enjoy the show. Okay, hello, and welcome to another episode of Biohacking Superhuman Performance. My name is Natalie Nidham, and today I am so pleased to welcome Alex Tarnava from, um, well, from lots of different places from what I can see, <laughs> but uh, primarily uh, from HR, the, who is the CEO of Drink HRW, which is, um, and I, I love your website, by the way. It's a company that manufactures and markets molecular hydrogen products. And uh, anybody who's been listening to this show knows that aside from being passionate about peptides, I'm fascinated with hydrogen and I have been for the last number of years. So I'm super excited about this. Alex is also the primary inventor of a clinically validated patent pending hydrogen water tablet. Can you tell I packed that up off your site? <laughs> well, it is, it, it is the open cup hydrogen tablet. So, you know, you, people have probably seen it a lot of different places. Um, I'm the primary inventor. Drink HRW is kind of my voice, right, um, that I, I, I channeled just to try and get messaging right. You know, it's something I read about that uh, a lot of times messaging for any area is led by one or two people and then everyone is kind of me too and they follow the leader. So if there's incorrect messaging, people say don't understand the science or they're a con artist or everything like that, but they show that they're the leader of the path. Now, all of a sudden, otherwise good and suspecting people are copying what they're saying and have no idea that what they're saying is wrong or unethical or any of these things. So um, Drink HRW, really, uh, I, I've been pumping a lot of effort into it just to put a voice to the front that is honest and accurate. Yeah, well, definitely, I came across what I would call your anthem. I don't know what you call it, but it's under the About tab, I think, and it's called Fight for the Truth. You know, like the what impressed me about the website quite apart from the fact that it looks beautiful, is that there's a lot of emotion and a lot more to it than getting people to buy a bottle of molecular hydrogen tablets. It's like clearly you have, like you're, you're on a mission. 
And we're going to talk about it because you've got other things going on as well. And I'm, I want to talk about the hydrogen, but I want to talk about this other piece of it because clearly what you're doing is about a lot more than moving product. So why don't you tell, I mean, you know, why don't you just tell us a little bit about how you got here, what brought you to the world of hydrogen, and then further on. Do you want the long or the short? We got time. So it was about six years ago, and um, I had another business that uh, it had me traveling about a week out of the month, and I'd work 100 hours that week. But when I was home between travels, I maybe only had to work 10 or 20 hours a week. So my life was exercise and reading, right? Just learning and reading for enjoyment, which was fantastic. I was training four to six hours a day. I was training as if I was a a pro athlete, but I wasn't. I was just doing it for small amateur competitions, you know, uh, to go head to head and, you know, some things with with guys who are pros, just to kind of show that I could do it, right? Um, Well, CrossFit and martial arts, you know, various martial arts. So it was, yeah, yeah, it was really my life probably at the peak of when I was the fittest that I've ever been in my life, I got sick. Uh, and uh, it was never figured out what I had. Uh, my best friend and roommate got sick also. He's a guy who, you know, back then would top five and, you know, triathlons and, you know, Spartan races, stuff like that. And um, it hit us different. Uh, he, he actually had pneumonia for, you know, and lost, missed about three weeks of work. Um, I didn't have pneumonia, but I had... Uh, central, you know, nervous system fatigue, shut down. I couldn't jump off the ground. I couldn't get airtime, right? I had no explosive movements. I went from, you know, being able to string together 15 to 20 bar muscle ups. And I had like a 54 inch plyometric jump to I couldn't jump an inch off the ground. And I couldn't even do a chest to bar, right? Because it needs a bit of explosion, but it, it didn't impact. I had no loss in strength. So I could still deadlift and bench press and squat the same amount, right? It's just, I had no explosive capability. I also had sudden onset narcolepsy, right? Um, I was sleeping 16, 18 hours a day. And if I'd sit down, right, for a minute or two, right, and I wasn't doing something, I'd fall asleep. Right. So I was actually trying to go to the gym for short periods, multiple times a day, just to keep me awake. So I'd keep moving. My inflammation was insanely high. It was at like 34 milligrams per deciliter, not 34 milligrams per liter, 34 milligrams a deciliter. So it was about 70 to 100 times higher what it should be. You know, I, I remember the walking clinic doctor I had at the time. So it was like the highest inflammation he'd ever seen. They were drawing blood twice a week, trying to figure it out. Um, I, was anemic, but you know, maybe it was all the blood drying, who knows, right? This was despite um, eating a diet that was basically red meat and, you know, green veggies, right? I was anemic and and it was just bizarre. It lasted for weeks, right? And they couldn't figure it out. All of a sudden the dust settled, my uh, inflammation went back to normal, but right away after everything kind of settled, uh, my body just stiffened, right? I couldn't go into a butterfly pose in the ground, whereas before I could touch either ankle to my face, right? From sitting, you know, like, uh, you know, needed that kind of flexibility for martial arts, obviously. My shoulder was killing me. I couldn't sleep and uh, went in, you know, for x-rays and such. And it was discovered that uh, I developed like moderate to advanced osteoarthritis in my left shoulder basically overnight in a matter of a few weeks right yeah it could have been all the inflammation that ran high for a few weeks just ravaged my joint Uh, the shoulder where it was really bad um, i had had a bad really bad injury playing football there Mm -hmm. um you know I, i broke it about a quarter inch below the shoulder socket and it pierced through muscle so i i've got now arthritis in like 11 spots but everywhere there was a pre-existing injury that had happened, you know, like it's where I'd broken bones before and it it all came and developed much sooner than it should have. I was 29. How old? Pardon? How old were you? I was 29. Wow. Okay. So I didn't want to give up at the time. Um, The doctors put me on a thousand milligrams of naproxen a day. So (laughs) I knew that wasn't long-term and I was looking into viable options to regulate my inflammatory response and hydrogen was popping up. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, this is six years ago. There was like nothing really commercially available, um, just water ionizers. Mm -hmm. I bought a water ionizer for like $4,500. And I was drinking it, just um, not knowing if it was working because I was always also on the naproxen. I'd gone in for a couple of cortisone injections and a hyaluronic acid injection in this short time frame. And I think it was, it was in the following May. So it wasn't that many months. It was only like eight months later. I fainted a, a couple of times during workouts at the gym. And I guess um, I developed multiple ulcers, right? You know, in a period of eight months from the naproxen. So I wasn't absorbing my food and nutrients properly. So I had to quit right away. My shoulder completely froze, right? Which told me that the hydrogen water I was drinking wasn't working. Uh, I went back to PubMed and was just scouring, 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 spending hours a day, you know, reading again at this time. Like I said, I was only working 10 to 20 hours a week and already like I tended to read back then four or five hours a day. All of my reading was surrounding on trying to read publications, see what could help me out. Hydrogen popped up a couple more times and um, that really pissed me off because it didn't do anything, right? <laughs> But then it just dawned on me, like, how do I even know I'm getting hydrogen water, right? I trust what a salesman told me from like a, a commission-based, you know, kind of like pyramid organization. And I found the H2 Blue test kit online. You know, I ordered it, tested the machine. I had to triple the intake to get one drop to reduce. So it was like 0.03 ppm. Was it like right. a black machine that shall remain nameless? Uh, white and black, but it was the most popular one a few years ago. It's still popular, you know? So it, it uh, was, uh, that actually gave me hope because I'm like, well, I haven't been getting, yeah, right. Um, so I went on a mission to get hydrogen. There was a, a original tablet on the market at that time that you had to seal in a bottle, right? They had actually just launched like when I found them in a couple brands, I, I bought the only couple options there was, like there was three options. All of them were making extreme claims about like curing cancer and all diseases on their website. So already they made my stomach turn, right? I didn't want to support them. Um, all three of them hit me up. I was a customer, had expressed no interest. They all hit me up, right? To try and get me to be like, you know, an affiliate or the one was an MLM to be part of their MLM. That one actually gave my phone number to like one of their master distributors or whatever that personally called me to try and convince me to join the MLM. And I'm like, this is some shady shit. And this is a breach of privacy, right? Why is my phone number being shared after I bought a single bottle of the product? So I actually, I just decided, you know, these products suck anyways. They were only getting about 0.3 PPM, right? Yeah. Doing it how they did. Um, I was able to modify it by a number of different ways. And I was getting, you know, two PPM, right? And actually my, my, my shoulder loosened back up, my hip loosened back up. Um, but I'm like, I'm having to do so much, right? To these garbage tablets to get them to work. And they're like giving my information away to try and get me to be a salesman, right? Unsolicited. And they're making illegal and unethical claims not supported by evidence. And I'm like, how can I give them money? Plus, you know, like we we're discussing off air, they weren't filing their NAFTA search or anything like that. So I was paying more in duties and taxes, bringing it in. And I'm like, I could make this better than they are, right? It's just what I thought to myself. So I started the do-it-yourself project. But I had a bit of a sober second thought. I'm like, you know, I, I know enough about the basic chemistry, but I don't want to be, you know, a Darwin Award winner here and blow myself up in my kitchen or, you know, kill myself or anything like that. And uh, I found my founding partner who was a, a PhD medicinal chemist. And I tried to show him what I was doing and ask for help. And he said, sure, I'll give you help. Abandon this. This is the worst pseudoscience I've ever heard in my life. Um, so he gave it a num number of reasons why it was not feasible and ridiculous. And I'd read them all at that point and ha had uh, educated myself enough to give him like a lot of responses. So I answered him, you know, systematically in, in all of his issues and said, this is why, this is why, this is why. And I sent him 15 of the better publications yeah. at that time. Um, he got back to me and he was, like, he was surprised that there was that much evidence. And he said, well, you know, it certainly appears that there's enough evidence, you know, 
for supplemental use, right? Kind of, you know, like, <laughs> you know, most supplements don't do anything. I have no evidence at all, whatever. Sure, I'll help you out. And it was just um, a little bit serendipitous because at this time, I still wasn't thinking of this as a career, just a do-it-yourself project for myself. I kept on sending him new publications every day as he was going over everything. And um, I sent him uh, the publication on Hep B. I didn't realize that uh, his current project that he was heading up was you know, a drug for Hep B. And he called me for lunch and he said, you know, like all the other publications, I just had to read the methods, look at the results and, you know, just trust the conclusions. Mm -hmm. He said, but for this one, he's like, unless, unless this is fraud, this actually works and could be impactful. Like, are you sure you just want to do this just for yourself and like you make things right. for yourself? I mean, like, as you said, there's nothing available on the market, right? And at that time, I decided to just tentatively go into it. We had, uh, he, he refined some of the chemistry on what I was doing, some of the formulation. We had uh, something that was satisfactory to me in three weeks, right? To make a, a mortar and pestle and press one at a time. But wait, this is in your kitchen? Yeah. Now, I know that the tablets themselves aren't hydrogen, but they release hydrogen when they react with the water. Yeah. Hydrogen is still kind of, you know. Well, above, you know. Kind of thing? Above 4.6%. Right. right. So you'd need to react a lot of it in your kitchen for it to be okay. you know, explosive. I mean, of course, we are using elemental magnesium, yeah. right, which is the white in fireworks. So that was my big concern. Um, but I mean, you know, it, we, we were doing it in such small amounts, right? Like, you know, and controlled well that uh, we weren't too concerned back then. But what we did realize is going from making a single tablet to making millions takes a lot of work, right? You know, what you have to do to run things and scale up and on mass for it to be safe and effective. And so it took us only a couple of weeks, few weeks, right, to get it to work in a mortar and pestle. It took another 16 months or something, right? Yeah. Of intuitive, you know, thousands of of adjustments, right? A lot of headache, bringing on experts from various in industries, from pharmaceutical formulators to engineers, you know, to manufacturing facilities until we got our first production ready tablet, right? And the one you have in front of you is thousands of more iterative adjustments in years. Wow. Years, years more of R&D. So it was exponentially more complicated than what we originally thought. It's just, it's all kind of pot odds you go a little bit further a little bit further a little bit further you know and you just keep on making it better and you know that's all great right because if it was as easy as we thought everyone would be doing it it would have but, been done. yeah for sure but for how complicated how hard it was to do that's protection in itself right that i'm the only one who's figured this out right how to do it like this you know that that uh, definitely um it, it was a lot of work um i started realizing that all the various experts from chemistry to engineering, to manufacturing to everything, um, they weren't considering the challenges in other areas. They were only right. thinking about their area. Right. You know, and even the pharmaceutical you know, formulation firms I hired um, to help, they were thinking of this more as like, you know, a traditional drug delivery. Mm -hmm. Just challenges on the, the machinery. They weren't considering the challenges of the reaction, right, of the actual chemistry. So I ended up having to quarterback it. I, I ended up reading every single publication, every single textbook I could find on the internet to download on pharmaceutical formulation. And I just developed a strategy um, that I kind of stole from Ray Kurzweil in that I had everyone boil it down to the simplest way they could. This is the challenge right? What we're dealing with in layman's terms. And I have all the challenges, write them down and just go to work. And then I go to each and say, if we did this, do you think this would impact? Yeah. Right. And then you know, we'd start doing, you know, everything, doing the formula adjustments and do everything, just trial and error, incremental adjustments, see what works, you know, and there was no easy way around it because the best laid plans on paper didn't necessarily work in reality. And that's why even with a lot of great brains on it, it still took us 
thousands of attempts until we got something to work the way we wanted it to work, right? We got lots that worked, but not to the standards we'd set forth and not to how we saw it was able to work. Right. So lucky us that you stuck it out. Um, (laughs) So you finally got the tablets and now you start marketing them. And obviously they helped you to a degree with the challenges that you were dealing with. And you never found out what it was that happened with you. You just eventually like your body is some sort of virus. I was going to say, like, would it be, is it any chance it would have been a virus that hit your nervous system somehow and just. And it's, yeah, I mean, we tell the doctors that like it was more than just me sick in the household, but it was expressing in completely different ways. Yeah. So could have been some mystery to virus, but no, they never figured it out. You know, you house, that guy from the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need that guy. Yeah. In yeah. real life. Like that real life guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so I, I started marketing it and still I was really hesitant to get into this field, right? Because I had a lot of reservations about the supplement industry and natural health. And I didn't want to be everything that I criticized and hated, right? You talk about there's a lot of passion on you know my website, like a lot of mission. And that was my ethical requirements for getting into this industry is if I'm going to do this, I need to do it in a way that I can look at myself in the mirror when I wake up and, you know, feel that I'm doing good rather than just trying to make a buck. Right yeah. So I developed our, our clinical outreach program, um, which, which started with me emailing every single researcher who'd ever published a paper on hydrogen to try and, you know, see if they were looking to do more research, right? If I could donate. The big problem with research on supplements and drugs and you know people talk about pharmaceutical companies controlling outcomes supplement companies do the exact same thing except the the difference is the papers are usually smaller and far worse quality so all of the criticisms right right, that that you know the natural industry level on pharmaceutical companies industry funded studies Mm -hmm. they are all the same the same criticisms can be said of the supplement industry funded studies and usually to a greater degree. Right. But that's not convenient to to say. So meaning that they're looking for an outcome. If they don't get the outcome, it's not public. They'll they'll stop publishing. Like they won't actually, which is crazy. Right. Because that's the whole point of learning is exactly. You share that and that gets the next guy going in the next direction. Exactly. Right. So what, what will happen is private companies will, will sign research co- contracts, which double as an NDA. So nothing can be shared, you know, unless the company chooses for it to be shared. The company will have final say on protocol, meaning that they set up the trial, giving it the best chance to succeed that it possibly can, which we're discussing on, you know, some of the popular biohacking devices, you know, and, and they're ridiculous, you know, like, trials that just are completely irrelevant. And then if they don't get the result they want, it's just thrown away. Yeah. Right? And, you know, there, there's no, you know, they're, they're making it law in Europe that you have to publish it if you register a clinical trial, but still it's only like 30 to 50% complied and there's no proper enforcement of this. Yeah. Um, a lot of funders are, are making it a requirement like in the U.S., like, you know, the NIH and stuff. But again, um, that doesn't include private research. They're trying to make it so that it does include private research, but if it's not registered, nobody ever knows. Yeah, you know, it's uh, almost impossible so to enforce. Yeah. If you, if you structure a trial in a way that's the best chance of success, and then you still have to run it multiple times to get the result you want, right? Did it work? Well, probably not, yeah. right? So I developed our clinical outreach program that I do not have final say mm-hmm. in study protocol, right? I'll, I'll discuss it. And there's actually, um, I'm going to be listed as an author in a couple of the upcoming papers because I had so much input on, on design and, and way, but I'm not the first author. I don't have final say, right, on any of this stuff. And I have no agreements which prohibit publication. Amazing. Right, right? the results are, are published regardless of the outcome. Right, which which is imperative the pursuit of the truth. 
right? We don't have any overwhelming, you know, phase three clinical trials that are done, you know, by any means. Our biggest trial was 60 participants for six months. It, it found a really good result. It was effective in 18 and 20 measured outcomes in metabolic syndrome. So yeah, I read that. That's amazing. Largely reversed metabolic syndrome. Um, but so what, what was the dose on that? Was that? It was three tablets a day, but only in 250 milliliters of water. So explain. So actually, can you explain this to me? Because I've always been a little mixed up about this and I would love to hear it from the source, as it were. Tell me about how much water, what's the advantage of putting this in more water or less water? And like, is there to your, like you just mentioned something now, like, would you use different amounts of water depending on what you're trying to do? Or is there- No, they they used less water than I'd recommend because they felt that people were going to, you know, the, the mostly older people, you know, that had metabolic syndrome was, were going to have a hard time drinking more than eight ounces of water, right? You know, in, in, a, in a go. You want to drink the water as fast as you can, yeah. uh, right? While the water is white. So the tablets are designed, the optimal range is between about 12 to 17 ounces of okay. room water. If you go outside of this range, it impacts the, the you know, dissolution kinetics right on a not consistent scale right so right. say at eight ounces you still might be getting 85 90 percent of the dosage that you'd be getting at 16 ounces but if you go to four ounces you might be getting less than half the dose right so is that because as the as the tablet dissolves right so now you've got the magne- the elemental magnesium there's something, and then there's the malic, there's like a, like a malic acid or. So basically the saturation point of hydrogen, you know, in water is 1.6 milligrams a liter. You know, we're delivering, you know, our GC results show that with the, the, you know, nanoparticles of magnesium that, that are reacting on their way down, um, you're getting about 12.4, right? So, you know, that's seven, eight times more yeah. right, the saturation point. Um, even then it's peaking at over seven ppm in, in 500 milliliters, right? So it's several, it's several times more hydrogen than the saturation point. And that's that white water, yeah. right? Now that cloud of white water exists for a number of reasons. You know, bubble diameter, like the small bubbles, it, it behaves under different physics. You know, <laughs> it is, sorry, it, it's getting close to his lunchtime, so he's being obnoxious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Um, uh, internal pressure, right. It is really important, right. With the, the dissolution kinetics, okay. right. As, as the pressure rises, it's trapping the bubbles right, right inside. So what happens is if you have too much water, it doesn't build up internal pressure, right? So you're, okay. you're not going to get more than 1.6. If you have not enough water, there's too much internal pressure. It slows down the reaction and only so much can stay right it, it's not it just doesn't keep on going up forever right it, it, it's it's you know it hits a limit and then it's diminishing returns right and how much will stay in the water so you know basically you want to be in this range right between about 12 to 17 ounces of water um or about 330 to 500 milliliters of water right for those on the metric scale and you uh, chug it like you want to as soon as it that uh, is gone exactly, you wanna, exactly. Yeah. As soon as the pill kind of rises to the surface and is breaking apart, you want to guzzle it down as quickly as you can, right? That's when you're going to get the highest dose that you possibly can. Not only that, but um, the, the basic research shows that hydrogen works by intermittent pulsing effect. So you want to high dose intermittently, right? So okay. you know, research will show that a high dose intermittent you know, exposure to hydrogen has an effect but a higher dose that's given continuously all day long has no effect, right? So if you're exposing, you know, a cell culture or an animal or anything to hydrogen 24 seven, there's no beneficial responses, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you can look at some of this stuff, you know, and, and it starts making sense in, in how hydrogen works by, by a cell signal transduction. The fact that every cell in our body always has a base level of hydrogen gas, right? We, we seem to need this burst and it starts changing things, it starts correcting things back to normal, right? If you don't get the burst, if it's just kind of a low level with constant exposure, it's not dramatically changing your cellular concentrations and it's conferring no benefits, right? Yeah. But not only are you getting the maximum amount by guzzling it down, 
but it's actually having the biggest impact on your cells also by causing right. down. And it's a shock. Like it's a signal. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, you're acutely raising the concentration of hydrogen, right, in your cells. And that's what's enacting all these benefits, you know, in, in alterations to gene expression and such. So it's, that's, that's why it's really, really important. So that, that's kind of the dose. They, they did three at 250 a day. So it was a fairly high dose. Um, we, we have the, the other study on, on NAFLD. They just did two and 500 milliliters a day. Um, that's what we typically recommend. In 28 days, it was a small study group, and we have a replication trial that's underway right now on NAFLD that's two months with 32 people, yeah. um, double blind placebo controlled. But in, in the 12 people, double blind placebo controlled crossover, so everyone did hydrogen and placebo one after the other. Um, it found in the 28 days, I think it was something like an 11% drop in AST. It was a significant drop in liver fat. or No, it was a 10% drop in AST. It was an 11% improvement in insulin sensitivity. That's right? amazing. Like, that yeah. is amazing. That's in people. And so I guess what would be interesting in a longer study is to see if those if you get more. You yeah, know? Like, exactly. And that's what... Then what turn it into 15% or does it... Is there a maximum return? Well, of? there's other downstream effects too, right? Which right. is what we saw in the metabolic syndrome study. It, it led to improvements, statistically significant, clinically significant improvements in 18 of 20 measured outcomes, yeah. right? So, you know, all, all of these things will have downstream effects. It starts helping this, and then it's going to start helping this and this. And um, so we, we've been uh, in business for going on four years. Uh, we have six published clinical trials. We have two published case studies, but we have 15 more clinical trials that are at various stages underway. And we have four preclinical research programs. So four research teams are studying, you know, um, in a preclinical sense, mostly rodents, right, for various endpoints. And I'm constantly looking, you know, like yesterday I was at, at uh, lunch with a professor just asking for, you know, more more um, introductions for people he knew that might want to start studying this. Um, you know, and it's, it's just, again, our, our kind of devotion to the truth, right, and to pursue these things. And so far, our, our eight publications, we have another clinical trial that's under peer review right now, and we have uh, two of the preclinical research programs that, that are under manuscript prep. So it's 11 for 11 so far in finding a benefit. But that might not always be the case. Of course. Right? So, so you've talked about metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, insulin sensitivity improvements. I know that molecular hydrogen and listening to Tyler LeBaron speak at a couple of uh, conferences, he's got a very well-known video that he shows of the rat. You know, they, this, I'm sure you've seen this a thousand times. Like it's the rat on, on the drum and they... They somehow induce Parkinsonian um, and Parkinsonism, I guess, on the rat. And the, on when they pretreat the rat with molecular hydrogen, it seems to protect the rat from from the. Um, and you know, rodents have had very strong results. You know, with, with hydrogen treatment and Parkinson's. Um, humans have been mixed. There's two clinical or three clinical trials on. on uh, in humans with Parkinson's, one found a pretty significant benefit. Yeah. The other, that was on water. The other on inhalation found no benefit, but it was a shorter, you know, study. And in rodents, uh, hydrogen water has worked significantly better than inhalation. Right. Yeah. I had uh, who had Parkinson's. Parkinson's. For yeah. Parkinson's, water has worked significantly better in rodents than, than inhalation. Um, the third study was on water, and it was the biggest study. Now. It found no benefit, but there was a serious issue, right, with the study. Namely being the placebo and hydrogen were messed up, and a significant amount of the placebo had hydrogen in it, right? Because what they were doing was a device in Japan, right, that uses aluminum, elemental aluminum actually to make hydrogen, and it's cartridges, and they were making hydrogen and apparently dumping it and then filling it back up with water, right? Presuming that all the reactives had gone. Well, that actually wasn't the case at the end. They realized that the placebo all had hydrogen because it hadn't so it been... So the baseline on the placebo, possibly. Yes. And 
in erratic fashion is what I've heard from some of the researchers. You know, uh, some of the placebos might have been low below what they thought was therapeutic, whereas other of the placebos were at about the level that the active group was getting. So they were pulsing with intermittent hydrogen. Now, apparently it had to be published, right? It should never have been published, but it had to be because of laws in Japan and from the funders on publishing the study. I've heard from a few researchers that they obfuscated how bad the mistake was in the abstract, and they didn't write a full paper because of how embarrassing yeah. it is. The methodology it could ruin their careers. It, That's as, good. It's ridiculous. It was a multi-center clinical trial, right, with hundreds of people over 80 weeks, and they weren't ensuring that the placebo was actually a placebo. That is such a shame. That it, is it, so sad. It, it's unbelievable. Um, the takeaway is both the hydrogen group and the placebo group. Got better. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to tell you, like, I had a client with... As, as, as compared, they lost a similar amount uh, of Parkinson's, you know, disease score as um, they lost about 10 points less than compared to numerous trials of the same length. So when you compare that trial to other trials that actually had placebo groups, they both appear to have significant benefit over other similar placebo groups, but we don't know. Now, now the good thing is um, we do have a clinical trial underway, or not we, but we, we donated you know, product and placebo to it um, at Stony Brook Medicine in, in uh, New York, and it's 52 weeks with 70 participants. Nice. Right? And you know, our placebo has no chance of making hydrogen. It makes CO2. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we'll find out more information in the coming years. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I was just going to say that I had a client with Parkinson's who, because I had I'd read what I'd read, I thought, you know, molecular hydrogen to me is one of those compounds that it doesn't seem to have a downside. So you get people to try it and see how they feel. And, you know, N of one and very subjective, but subjectively, she would say to me, she'd wake up in the morning craving her molecular hydrogen. And, you know, she definitely felt that it was making her, it made her feel better during the day. So yeah. completely unscientific, one person, but definitely I was actually, you know, it was kind of one of those, I had to stop myself from saying, really? <laughs> it's Yeah. I mean, hopefully we find out more, right? Because the results in rodents have been very strong. Um, there, there's issues with all the human evidence so far. Uh, yeah. We just need better research, right? Guys, like that's another area. Traumatic brain injury. Yeah. So, um, and I wrote a blog on this, and uh, there's a few handful of rodent studies on TBI. We have a case study, right, on, on a concussion, right, in, in a pro soccer player that that you know seemed promising, but again, it's a, a case study, right? It's an N of one. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see more clinical research on this regard. I, I've contacted a lot of teams about it. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of research teams out there that get enough concussion cases nope. uh, to, to do it. So I've had a, a hard time uh, getting this research going. There's a lot of things I want to do that it's been hard to get, you know, done um but it, it's on my list right um i know we provide product to a couple hundred ufc fighters yeah i saw that on your we're, site we're officially you know working with several dozen pro athletes and i know uh, some of these big management agencies you know and some of the bigger teams in you know mma it's the first thing they do they they, they load up their their guys with hydrogen um they find it helps them one with their weight cut right that dehydration can lead to, to worse you know concussions and tbi and yeah. then after the fight they give them hydrogen right away interesting you know? so so for joe blow on the street like i mean when i was you know you read about molecular hydrogen and the big three things that we talk about that it seems to affect which fundamentally seem to be at the foundation of most of the issues that people develop or are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis is the oxidative stress, the inflammation, and insulin sensitivity. Like between those three, those are three yeah. big 
leaders in human health. So for, yeah, definitely. So for someone who's listening to this and who's like, okay, well, I don't have a TBI. I don't have Parkinson's disease. I don't think I have alcoholic fatty liver. I don't have metabolic syndrome. Why would I use molecular hydrogen? I mean, I could think of a bunch of reasons, but why would you say that, you know, people could benefit from a hit, maybe two of molecular hydrogen a day? There's a brand new study that was done in healthy people. It wasn't a big group. It was only 38, but yeah. uh, it, it found, um, you know, that uh, basically hydrogen in health, otherwise healthy people did significantly lower inflammation, not in everyone, but those above 30 lowered oxidative stress and um, it, it uh, lowered, you know, cell death apoptosis, yeah. right? In healthy people. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to think that hydrogen would be good for healthy people. At its core, hydrogen has shown to, to regulate our stress responses to all sorts of things, right? Um, there's tons of research. Here. You put mice under various stresses from hang tail to force swim to you know sleep deprivation, all of these things, and the mice on hydrogen perform better. It protects them against various stress assaults. That actually, we, we saw that in one of our clinical trials. It was, uh, I think, 22 or 23 people you know, crossover in a head-to-head -head versus caffeine. We found that uh, after 24 hours sleep depth, Hydrogen raised alertness equivalent to caffeine. Really? Right? But it's not a stimulant. No. Right? Yeah. And it, it affected a region, right, of, you know, attention that uh, caffeine doesn't alter, right? Mm -hmm. Something called orienting. Right. So we actually have a replication study about that underway. Um, you know, we have we have some really cool rodent research on, on various, you know, models that that you know, have to do with stress, right? Uh, that show that hydrogen is pretty impactful. And these are stresses that you find every day. There's research showing that hydrogen can protect against, um, you know, things like side effects of, of various pharmaceutical drugs, whether it's just Tylenol, right? Or, you know, more, more serious things like, uh, you know, radiation and chemotherapy, right? Like there, there's a lot of evidence that hydrogen can protect against a lot of stresses ranging in size. Um, even one where, where a really cool um, study showed that uh, in, uh, I think it was rats that were exposed to um, the, the chemical known to be an agent orange that caused all yeah. the de devastation. Uh, those rats, uh, their, their NAD plus to NADH levels were protected after exposure. Really? And as was cellular senescence. Huh. Right? So they were completely protected against the, this toxic exposure, right? right? Or, or blunted anyways. There's a lot of other stuff I, I can't go into well, yet. Yeah. I think that one of the things that's really fascinating about hydrogen that, again, um, I've heard talked about quite a lot is this, is this issue that it seems to be a selective antioxidant. You know, people, we hear about people... It's, it's, people are over that now, pounding, pounding antioxidants. And, and that's not good for you, right? Yeah. In fact, uh, in fact uh, studies show that high-dose antioxidant treatment actually is bad for you, right? Yeah. It increases cancer risk. It increases all-cause mortality. It, it you know, increases, it, it interferes with a lot of drugs and medications, including cancer treatments itself. So not only could it increase your cancer risk, but then it could interfere with your treatment of the cancer. Yeah, um, yeah. Hydrogen actually isn't, you know, in vivo in the human body. It doesn't appear to be an antioxidant. And this is what's really cool about hydrogen because it's not an anti-inflammatory either. Mm -hmm. there, there are models that show that hydrogen actually raises oxidative stress. Right? There's models to show it raises inflammation, right? But more often than not, we have an excess, right? Because yeah. what hydrogen seems to do is it seems to regulate yeah. the stock status in, in our cell, the harmony between oxidative stress and you know our, our body's own production of antioxidants, right? It seems to regulate our inflammatory response. There are some cases where you want more inflammation. Inflammation yeah. is important. It's part of our immune system, right? Yeah. Uh, but Chronic inflammation can be a bad thing. So hydrogen has shown to regulate our inflammatory response. It's shown to regulate the redox status. Um, and this is very important, right? Because that shows that it, it's restoring proper function, right? In these critical systems in our body. And it's not acting as a pharmacological agent that either blunts or activates 
an exact process, right? Yeah. Having this wide range where in this model, it's blunting in this model, it's raising, right? And, and we've seen that in, in other models like um, in autophagy, right? There's multiple publications with hydrogen and autophagy. And in most cases, hydrogen activates autophagy, which is usually good. But in a heart failure model, it blunted autophagy, which was good for that model. Interesting. Well, because there's um, there's one guy in particular who, again, um, we won't name names or anything, that talks about molecular hydrogen. As a matter of fact, he's even named his tablets um, like with the word fast in it. And he talks about how molecular hydrogen makes fasting easier or... Uh, and to your point, uh, may upregulate autophagy during fasting so that people don't. Yeah, have I, I, I've I've been on his his podcast too. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I, I I fast right. I fast quite often. Um, twice a week, I fast for forty three to forty eight hours. But once every two months, I fast for seventy two. And once or twice a year, I fast one twenty. And I will take hydrogen in the evenings when I fast, right? Because I find it, it curbs my appetite quite a bit and gives me a, a pick-me-up when I'm at my most hungry and irritable. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, one publication, right, that shows that hydrogen increased survival rate in, in uh, um, I think it was fruit flies, that were starved. Okay. Uh, so they, they lived longer. Um, hydrogen has shown to regulate stresses for a lot of different hormetic stressors, not yeah. just mentioning the result, but mitigating the damages. It's, it's a, a reasonable hypothesis to think it could help yeah. for fasting. Um, we just need better evidence on yeah. that. I mean, we need better evidence in fasting in general, right? And yeah. I, I know it's, it's starting to come out, but it's something I've written about. A lot of the fasting research that people cite isn't what we think of as fasting in the biohacking community. Because they use Ramadan as a model. And that's not fasting. That's 24, that's 24 hour fasting, isn't it? It's like, well, it's nomad. No, isn't it's it? it's, it's just a reverse eating schedule. You can eat once the sun goes down. Right. <laughs> Which actually flies in the face of all the circadian research that no. says don't be eating after six o'clock. Like, you know, the, it, it, as a matter of fact, don't eat after the sun goes down. There is hundreds of publications that they call like, cholesterol benefits of fasting, all of this. But when you actually read into it, they're using Ramadan you know, <laughs> as a model. I'm, I'm dead serious, right? And again, it's one of these things that so many people will cite research and they haven't actually read the research, yeah. right? Because yeah. most people just read the headline. They're like, great, that's exactly what I'm looking for, right? And they cite it. And then you see, you know, this influencer cites something because they just read the headline, Right, and then the next just does it because so and so cited it, and all of a sudden it's you know like wildfire through the community, and nobody's actually read the publication. So you're saying so there's no real research on like 72 hour fasting, 24 hour there, fasting. There is, there is, you know, and I, I wrote um, I wrote an article on it. I actually wrote um, it's 25 or 30 thousand words on hormesis that I wrote in a you know seven part series. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, I actually uh, I am. Um, spinning that and a lot of the other stuff I've written um, into into a book. I, I'm working on two books right now. But um, yeah, there, there is some evidence, but it's not as good as what most people think. I also but think it's is, not as universal. You know, it's not as universal. Like people talk about, like, you know, in my work with clients, people yeah. come in and they're like, okay, I want to fast. And I'm like, well, you're not ready. You know, like it's not it's, it's not the panacea that I think it's being presented as. And, um, and, and that's what's that's, getting people uh, to understand that. Yeah. And, and even a lot of the, the research that is on fasting isn't on fasting, how everyone talks about it. It's more on time restricted eating, yeah. right? But there, there is some research, right? And there is some research on fasting. There isn't none, right? There is some, right? But it's not as much as we'd like to see, yeah. right? Yeah. We need more, right? We need to understand it better, right? We, we need to apply it better. And I think a big problem and the reason why a lot of researchers shy away from this kind of thing is what you'll get is something has a good concept behind it. It's promising, right? And then a lot of people profit off of it, right? And they treat it as a cure for everything, like you said, a panacea, mm -hmm. right? Now what happens? Every good academic says, 
this is pseudoscience. There's no evidence for this because there is insufficient evidence, right? Now, no good researcher wants to touch it because of the stigma behind it, right? Because, you know, some people in, you know, Altmed, natural health say it's a panacea and cures everything, right? So no legitimate research wants to touch it because it's going to ruin their career, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's something we need to change culturally within, you know, within biohacking, within integrative medicine is to stop talking about this stuff that just has very preliminary evidence as a miracle and panacea, because that's what stops research progression. Interesting. Right? Because what department, what researcher wants to risk their career over something that's become polarized and has right. a bunch of false claims on it? Yeah. No, for sure. It's yeah, because it puts them in an oppositional position. So speaking to that, that's an interesting segue. So we'll wrap up on, you know, we could talk a lot about molecular hydrogen, but bottom line, I mean, one, one of the things I think that I've always been impressed with on molecular hydrogen, and I don't know if the science is there, but I think I read this on molecular hydrogen Institute site. So I'm pretty confident they're on the up and up, um, is that to, today there's no real toxic dose so people don't, I mean, and maybe there is, but it's not like anybody's going to run around chugging a whole bottle of the stuff. Well, you, you can't. I mean, you, you can, right? Like, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, you definitely die of everything else, like right? Hy- like hypernatremia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you die of the water before you die of the hydrogen, right? Yeah. Drink hydrogen water. Um, we, we'll use hydrogen in, in a thousand times a dose for, for you know, deep sea diving. Right and like hydrolyzed mixes, so there is no toxic dose. We know um, even uh, in, in things like um, hydrogen-induced hallucinations, right? The dose is much higher than things like nitrogen, right? Which is making up our atmosphere. Right? So hydrogen safety, it, it, it's it's incredibly safe. There could end up being right contraindications or could end up being side effects. But uh, in a book chapter I just wrote for Elsevier USA, and, and we looked through all the human evidence. There are, are is really no pattern. There's only a few, a handful, right, of reported adverse events. And they all could be things like just increased water intake, increased magnesium, right? Like things like loose stools, right? And upset stomach. You know what I mean? There's no serious side effects that have been reported yeah. so far. So, yeah, it's it's it seems to be incredibly safe. What we know about hydrogen, it's incredibly safe. We're producing up to 10 liters of hydrogen gas a day through bacteria, breaking down carbohydrates in our small intestine. Um, Everything we know about it, it's incredibly safe. Okay. And then, so the last thing I wanted to touch on, because you do have a product in your product line that are these bath tablets. So you want to talk about that a little bit? So clearly you're seeing benefit in people absorbing it through their skin. Yeah, actually the pro athletes are liking them a lot better, you know, in in a lot of cases than than, uh, drinking even, because they're the ones who need it the most. So we have um, a clinical trial and a case study on grade two ankle tears, right? Yeah. Um, case study showed pretty dramatic swelling reduction in a pro soccer player. The clinical trial was in, in pro soccer play- players also. It found um, that after like the, the, the foot bath on the same protocol as the right protocol, which is rest, ice, compress, elevate, that um, hydrogen was as effective, but trending across the board to be more effective than rice. So in a bigger group, that would have been statistically significant. Um, we just have another small clinical trial that is under peer review right now, but uh, pro- provided that gets through peer review, it indicates that um, you know a single bath significantly reduced muscle soreness, both subjectively on the vast scale and by creatine kinase yeah. right after you know, exhaustive exercise. You know, some emerging evidence that hydrogen bathing could be really effective and effective in ways that hydrogen water isn't, which makes sense. You're going to be getting a higher spike in cellular concentration, right, to your muscles, to your skin. We're setting up some other clinical trials on the bath tablets also. And so when you use them in the bath, because you can't, you you know, the one of the contradictions, well, it's not a contradiction, but you wouldn't put a tablet like this into warm or hot water because you would lose your hydrogen in, like really quickly. So for the bath, is this for people doing cool or cold no, baths? No, or we, you, actually- you use them in warm to hot water. We, 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 um, we just change the pressure and we change the formula a little bit to take it a bit longer to react, right? Because, okay. you know, if you want to, really important 
with the, the dissolution kinetics is a reaction kinetics, how quickly everything's reacting. You put um, the drinking tablet in hot water. Not only are you not going to be able to chug it properly, yes. right? Yes. but yes. it's going to react far too fast, so you're going to lose a lot of the hydrogen. Right. right? Yeah. You can address that by changing the speed of reaction disintegration, which we did for the bathtub. I see. Okay. Interesting. And oh, actually, last thing is on these ones, sometimes I'll put lemon in my water, both for taste, but I think, does it also help it to dissolve a little bit faster? It it does. And actually, um, if you add a little bit of lemon, you might even be retaining a bit more hydrogen. Uh, One of my pending patents has to do with with various um, polysaccharides, you know, fibers, um, creating gels and foams with hydrogen gas, right? I've actually turned, you know, hydrogen, like trapped it in like hard gel like a gummy, right? Using different polysaccharides. So we tend to measure higher levels of hydrogen when you use like a tablespoon of lemon juice. Oh, interesting. And so when you said gels, I was automa- automatically started thinking like face application or, or topical, topical yeah. application. But it's, um, the issue with that is it might, I, I've been experimenting with that, but you want it to get into your skin quicker, right? If it's too stable, right? And you don't have something like your gastric it's acids to break apart, right? Like say with the gel, what would be really important is if you had a super high dose and you consumed it and your stomach acid broke the gel down immediately to release the gas in your stomach, uh, you wouldn't have that with a foam or a lotion, right? But you'd have to make a fresh, very structurally weak foam to put onto your Skin, which again, it's, it's something I'm working on. But yeah, that was something you could add a powder, like you'd have a bottle of fo- some foam stuff and like a, a scoop. Yeah, and like a little mortar and pestle or a bowl, and you know, yeah, whip it yeah it's stuff I've been working on. It's just uh, I I don't like going to market with things until you're ready. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about this is great. So molecular hydrogen is a modulator really of inflammation and oxidative and redox reactions essentially in the body, which is great. And one of the other project, I mean, you have a lot of projects on the go, but the other website that you sent me, which I'm pretty fascinated with. And I think people, you know, you said it's very new. I th- hopefully is going to get a lot of traction is my science. And this is, I mean, this sounds like it's, it's a pet project very near and dear to your heart. And it's really targeted to the self quantifiers who we can call biohackers, which are the N of one guys who basically, you know, we do so many different things all at once and rarely know what it is that's affecting us. And so it sounds like you've started this project to help people to become a bit more disciplined and structured about what they're doing. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, like I said, it's one of the biggest issues I see in biohacking is, you know, people don't really know the evidence. They trust what others say on the evidence. How do we know those people are trustworthy and they haven't, you know, been bought or like paid to do something, you know, especially the bigger, um, the bigger, some of these guys followings get, they're under intense pressure to keep on finding what's new. Right. Yeah. They're going to sacrifice quality, right. To be the first to talk about something. Right. And, and and it's that, uh, that, that um, expert catch 22. That, that's talked about in a lot of, you know, um, a lot of research and uh, a lot of books is that the more famous someone becomes, right, the worse their quality and accuracy becomes, right? Because they're under the spotlight. They have to be finding what's new and what's good. Um, so I think that we have a tremendous opportunity that we're, we're squandering in society today. You know, everyone, like so many people, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people are wearing wearable technologies. I, I, I've reviewed multiple. I wear an Aura ring. I just did a, a huge four-part review comparing Aura to Biostrap to Whoop. Right? Oh, nice. What'd you uh, find? Oh, I'll read it. It's okay. Yeah, Aura 1. I think the Biostrap is the worst device I've ever tested. No. It's an absolute piece of garbage, in my opinion, in, in every way, shape, or form. Right. Or read it, you know, from from the skin rashes I got, like breaking down my skin, to the inaccuracy of it, to the the battery life, to the inconsistency in doing it. I, I mean, I, I'm using it right now for another review on a device to try and get, you know, my HRV after intensive workout. Yeah. And I've had to do, I'm just only just trying to do six workouts. I have two data points so far only, right? but I've done seven workouts because the other times 
it takes 10 minutes in most of them to get this data from Biostrap. And then it says, could not read, right? Sit still as I'm like dead still. Well, now it's just thrown off my experiment. So I have to try it again the next day. One time it actually took 38 minutes, right? To process, right? You know, my, my biometrics reading and my follow-up is in 30 minutes. So now it's thrown off the follow-up, right? So I'm going to have to do like 30 exercises to get the six I want using the bio strap. It has no battery life. It takes longer to charge. I, I'm excited. I, I just, I, I just uh, reviewed the aura against the sleep tracker with my wife and I too. Um, I, again, I found the aura one, but I, I have some others that I'm trying. I, you know, I didn't write reviews, but you know, I've owned the garments. Um, my wife wears a garment. She okay. loves it, but she wear the strap or a watch. Um, she wears a watch. Which one? I don't know. Um, but I was looking through it. I, I want to find one with better sleep functionality because her sleep functionality isn't very good, right, on her Garmin. Um, I'm on the pre-order list with that new Amazon watch that I, I'm going to test out. I've owned Fitbit yeah. and Apple Watches. Um, Amazon Halo. Yeah, the Halo. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to continue doing this to try and look because a lot of people look to these wearables and and – what are their methods? What are their algorithms? Are they accurate? You know what I mean? Like for instance, a sleep tracker, uh, it was better for me than my wife, but you know, for some reason for my wife, like if she'd like lay on the bed to plug in her phone at 5 PM and get off after like 30 seconds, it would think she was in bed from 5 PM till 8 AM the next day. You, you know what I mean? Just absolutely absurd. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, or if the cat would lie on the bed, it would think, one of us was sleeping on the bed and they say that they've accounted for things like small children and, you know, cats, but our cat's 12 pounds yeah. right? registering, you know, us sleeping. So again, this is part of what I'm doing to see what wearables are the best, but the sleep tracker, is that the, um, is that that band that goes under your sheet? Under your, under your bed. Oh, I used to have that years I, or I had something similar to that. I gave up on it. I got so annoyed with it. Like at the end of the yeah. day, this is the one. For yeah. me, I had a Garmin band, and I, I have I have issues with Aura that I detailed. I think they can make a lot better ring, yeah. uh, but uh, they're the best so far that I've tested. Mm -hmm. Right you now, I'm hoping for improvements. I'm hoping some of the things get addressed. Um, you know, but I, I did this. I tested a lot of the units because we're doing a clinical trial that's utilizing right. Right, wearable technology. So I wanted to see what was the most accurate with some of the researchers we were working with. So I bought everything and you know had them all go head to head to head and then wrote as a review but bottom line is hundreds of millions of people are wearing these wearables yeah right? and, and these are people who are trying things with their health they're trying new diets they're trying supplements they're trying protocols but the issue is you know someone might go and follow you know a, a new influencer and they want to change their health so they try 10 things at the same time yeah right maybe yeah. person a tries 10 things at the same time and they get healthy but which work, mm -hmm. right? So it's just money. You're just spending tons of money, right? Then another person tries 10 things and they don't get better. What if one of those things is making you feel like shit, mm -hmm. right? The other are canceling out. We need, to, so my journey.science is going to do a few things. One, you know, it's going to teach tutorials on just the very basic scientific concepts, like trying one thing at a time, controlling it, right? And trying to find out if it worked for you, right? We're going to have templates right? That walk people through how to do this. You want to try out this new protocol for 30 days. You need your 30 day baseline data. You need your 30 days to compare, right? You need to input your data, do these things. These are things you should think of. You know, you shouldn't go on a one week bender, but be really healthy. You know, right. in the month. you shouldn't do these things. You want to control it as best as you can. So it's going to send to an app and emails. So people to make sure they're compliant, like, you know, have you done this? Have you done this? So they should be inputting their data throughout the period they're doing. They're basically registering their own case study, right? On themselves for this. At the end, they're going to see, did this work for me or didn't, right? There'll be a questionnaire like, did you see improvement in your sleep? What was the improvement? What else have you tried? All these things. And at the end of the day, it's going to compile this database, right? Say 10,000 people have tried, you know, this Interesting. Right, herbal remedy and only 2,000 have found a benefit and 4,000 have had side effects, right? Yeah. 
because yeah. already researchers are, are scouring places like Twitter to look for reports on drug side effects. And Reddit. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? To look for these things. We need a systematic approach to do this, right? Now someone can go to my journey about science, like once all this is underway, and they'll be like, I have sleep issues because I'm overweight. Mm-hmm. Right? And they can look and type in sleep issues, right? You know, because you're overweight. And they'll see these are the 30 other things that people have tried. This has the best success rate. This is where you can try. Now, on top of that, you know, we're going to be selling placebos, right? So you can get your spouse to placebo control it for you, right? Here's a bag with placebo. Here's the bag with this pill. You don't know which is which, right? That way you actually know if you're getting a benefit. So we're going to do things like this. Um, we'll take, you know, donations, stuff like that. And all the money we raise, because nobody, you know, nobody's going to be on salary. In my journey.science, it's all volunteers. It's myself. There's a few people from academia that are helping out with the project, a few more that are, um, a few biohackers, uh, prominent biohackers that are going to get involved and a few more in academia that are, you know, want to make sure it's not going to be a huge project for them and they can just do a little bit of work and help out. But um, it's going to turn into a pretty big project. And as we're raising money, we're going to give grants to researchers to explore the things that are finding the best benefit. Nice. Other, you know, thing that we talked about is a lot of these things, it, they could work great, right? But too many people in, in AltMed and Integrative Health call it a panacea. And so no researcher wants to touch it. Yeah. We're going to be systematically tracking, right, results. And now researchers say, huh, this seems to work in 60% of people. We should do a trial. Right. Well, there's a grant, right, that you can do your trial. And so how much of the personal information of the individual is going to be tied to their data? Are you, are you, you know, because that, that, that's going to be everyone's, everyone's choice, right? Yeah. So we're going to do things like um, if people want to remain anonymous, that's mm-hmm. totally fine, right? People can upload genetic reports. So researchers can start looking at genetics, right? To look at what's working. Maybe you have, you know, this gene and this treatment works and it's finding that only people with this gene has it. So we're going to be integrating stuff like this, but other people want to show off what they're doing, right? So we're going to have a leaderboard and I'm I'm currently, if if there's, you know, a grad student statistician listening to this right now, reach out to me because we're looking for a statistician because we want to weight, right? The submissions, right? How many controls did the person have? right? Were they compliant in the follow-up emails, right, to show this? So maybe a perfect submission with the best controls they can do, everything is a one, and someone who just kind of submitted something weren't compliant is a point one, right? right? Because yeah. now people's going to get weighted, but we need someone with a strong back- background in statistics to help with this. Um, if I can't find a volunteer, we're going to ha- I'm going to end up having to hire someone you know, kind of out of pocket to, to get it to work. But we're really looking for a volunteer. I think it would be a really great project for a grad student, right, mm-hmm. that would be interested in this. But there will be leaderboards that will show, right, people that want to show, right, this is what I'm contributing, right, they'll be able to have all their submissions linked to their profile on a leaderboard. And then you can click to their blog or their social media, right, so people can go and follow what yeah. they're doing. Now, the only stipulation is we have it in the, the terms that your blog or, or you know, profile cannot be designed to sell a specific product, right? So we know a lot of influencers will endorse a wide variety of products, but it can't be like, I couldn't have a profile and drive people to drink HRW, right? That would get me banned for use, right? All right. Cool. That's amazing. That's, I, I'm, I'm in. I want to do that. I'm, I'm totally in. Okay. So I think we've been chattering away for quite a while now and your cat is pretty much thinking you've put it on some kind of a fasting protocol that it did not agree to <laughs> between the anti bird collar and all this. Yeah, he's pretty particular with being fed. <laughs> well, listen, my dog at five o'clock sharp is sitting doing the stare. So I totally get that. So Alex, where can uh, people find you? How do, you know, how do we follow? I mean, this is super exciting. I'll put a link for HRW. I actually do have an affiliate link for HRW, which I will share later because I can't remember what it is right now. Um, But where do people find you? And also myjourney.science, all that kind of stuff. I don't really have a social media following myself, right? It's, you know, I think 
you know, I've got like 90 people who know me and I, I just post my cooking photos, right? So no, uh, no need to follow me by any means, but uh, we're, we're at drinkhrw on Instagram. Um, you can see all the pro athletes and everything. The big thing with drinkhrw.com, that, that's where my blogs go out. Yeah. Right. If you go to our newsletter, I tend to write a couple thousand words a week that go out in the newsletters um, to the blogs. And we actually just added uh, multiple um, contributors to the site um, from medical doctors to epidemiologists to, um, uh, you know, a, a girl with, a, you know, PhD in, um, uh, sorry, I'm having a brain fart. Um, we, we just added a few anyways. We're going to have a lot of new cool content. Um, aside from myjourney.science, I've started this biohacking review section where I'm going to be doing highly detailed N1s with all the most prominent N1s and N2s with all the most you know prominent devices and such in the biohacking world. Look out! <laughs> So, um, I mean, I, I actually, uh, it just went up last week. I found a slight benefit in the Uller, right? Uh, it did, uh, it did benefit my sleep. Uh, my wife saw zero benefit to it and she doesn't like it at all. Interesting. But, Cause I have one of their competitors from Can a Canadian competitor. Yeah. I've been dragging that thing like my blankie between my cottage and my city house ever since I got it. Like I love it. So interesting. We found it was complete. I found it was completely ineffective during a heat wave, right? Because I used to control against air conditioning, right? So yeah, the third, I didn't have air. Yeah. So definitely over air conditioning, it would have been a dramatic improvement. But they advertise that it's superior to air conditioning, right? So I tested against air conditioning and I did see a slight benefit, right? For my data, right? With the Uller with air conditioning, my wife saw no difference. But um, I then, before starting another project, just for two weeks, ran AC and the Uller, and that was gold for me. Like, you know, if I'm not running a control, and actually I might just reset 30-day data, right, to start and always run air conditioning and mm -hmm. the Uller as my baseline, because that, that was significantly better. The only complaint I have with the Uller... Um, it is uh it's kind of clammy you know like it, it's more, it's clammy it's more clammy than it is cold like clammy like damp oh interesting so the one i i mean you may want to compare this there's um there's another company am i allowed to name them here sure is it okay. bed no it's called the perfect sleep pad mm -hmm. and he's the guy that markets the chili pad in canada anyway he's got his own story there's another episode with him but um he that's the one that I've used. And I found the, you know, my biggest complaint, I mean, I love it. And I find that it's my sleep metrics definitely got better. Although the last few days they've been bad. I don't know what's going on with me, but yeah. one thing that um, I find is I, I'm very sensitive to noise in the night. And yeah. I actually also recently acquired, a, I don't know if you've ever seen these pillows called the sleep crown. No. So it's a pillow you put over your head when you're sleeping and it's very soft and fluffy and it just wraps around your head and over your ears. And that was just enough to take the edge off the sound so that the sound's no longer an issue and the coolness of the mattress. I don't find it clammy, but I don't, I've never, I've never used a newler, so I couldn't tell you if it's. Yeah. Different. I've heard from others. They find it clammy. I'm sure it isn't like in the winter time. Yeah. Right. But um, yeah. And, and my wife um, is really bothered by the wires like the, the tubes, the hoses, right? She finds it very uncomfortable. We should talk about this offline because we were yeah, yeah. saying goodbye and now we're on a whole other topic. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's... Oh, it's yeah, I, I found a benefit in that. So I'm, I'm not just setting out to... I, I was just... My point is I'm not setting out to debunk all the devices. I hope they work. I yeah. want them all to work. Yeah. But I'm not going to take their word for it. Exactly. Amazing. So it's drinkhrw.com to yeah. get molecular hydrogen and to read all of these interesting blogs. And is the biohacking comparison on drinkhrw.com or is that in a different? Yeah. yeah the ones I write are on drinkhrw.com. Okay. So my journey.science will just be straight up kind of like data. Else. Right? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And like data and like, you know, we aren't fully, we aren't launched yet, but I think by the time this goes live, because it's supposed to be done this week, um, we'll at least be collecting names for the newsletter for once we're ready to launch. Amazing. 
Okay. Well, Alex, thank you so much for today. Um, I really enjoyed this. It was a long chat and we could probably chat longer, but we've got to feed the cat. So <laughs> thanks so much for your time. I hope we get to talk again. I really love all that you're doing. Likewise. Glad to be on here. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me today on this episode. If you decide that you'd like to try molecular hydrogen tablets for yourself, got a great discount code for you. All you've got to do is go to drinkhrw.com and use promo code longevity10 to get 10% off your purchase. And also, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes, assuming that, of course, you enjoyed the show. And because it's these ratings and reviews that keep us going and help this show to be more visible on iTunes. If you'd like to connect with me, either because you'd like to work with me or you'd like to leave a comment or some questions, you can either connect with me through my website, which is natnidham.com, or come on out and join me in my Facebook group called Biohacking Superhuman Performance. Thanks again. Have a great day.